yeah so almost all electronic gadgets today have a smart component and uh, they're kind of everywhere so there's no notion of what this um, a, a, a device that cannot do computing these days okay now uh, let's start with a basic objective uh, what, why should i do this course now you are the person uh, to answer this question um, depending on what kind of requirements so if you're from a business analytics viewpoint you may have to write code for a particular application that your company needs or something like that um, so as i said uh, in the future uh, programming is expected to be a basic skill just like doing arithmetic by hand was considered a basic skill even 70 years ago now for that you should have uh, you know a basic understanding or a mental model of how computers work even though not a precise uh, in great pre precise detail you should be able to write own programs for custom purposes right and uh, um, have a basic understanding of how computers can be used to automate repetitive tasks um one uh, mantra that you can keep in mind is that if a task is repetitive tedious and involves a lot of manual labor it can probably be automated and um, one way of automating it would be to write a small script and uh, if you keep this in mind that if if i have a manual task that involves a lot of tedium and a lot of repetition maybe there is a script that can do it. so uh, in that sense programming is expected to be a standard skill that everybody should have okay so um now a brief introduction to uh, you know the process of programming uh, programming is nothing mysterious it is just a systematic way of um, explaining how to solve a problem so you have a problem description and uh, normally you would think that from the problem description you go straight and uh, solve it in uh, code so you pick a programming language and then write the code uh, from scratch this is usually not how things go so how things would go is that you formulate a model of the problem often the problem description is given in a real world setting and um, you may have to um, make things more precise Uh, like what is the expected output what kind of inputs are expected what is the range of the input what are the constraints and so on and how how exactly do we need the output so you need to construct a model of the problem not exactly a mathematical model but at least a more precise model for which you can write a program then you come up with a logical solution and this is what is usually called an algorithm um for the purpose of this course the algorithms will be very simple they'll be straightforward and then once you come up with a logical solution you write the code you pick a programming language that you are comfortable in uh, and then write the code in that so um this course will help you to uh, once you get a logical solution how do you write the code in python okay now once you uh, are more comfortable with programming of course there's no distinct phase uh, expert programmers do often go straight from the problem description to the solution but um, this is even for expert programmers um, there is a sense in which you should pause and ponder what is exactly to be done and it always helps in clarifying the solution okay so um, as i said the step uh, the first step would be to define uh, and model the problem uh whenever you have a customer or somebody uh, and the customer could be yourself i want this i want to automate this task uh this is often uh mentioned in a very vague language because customer requirements are not often precise and it's up to the uh, programmer to uh, examine what is the mod, uh, what is the problem and uh, design it in such a way that the model is extremely precise and can be programmed and can be solved using a problem now if the model is proper which which means it could either be too vague and therefore does not solve anything meaningful or it could be over precise and it solves something but it does not solve the actual problem so you know there's a balance to strike 
So it should be precise enough and it should solve something close to a real world problem. So if you have a complicated system like, um, you know, okay, for example, the Indian Railways, which handles a huge number of uh, millions of passengers every day and reservations and so on. So if, uh, you know, if you don't model it properly, like the expected demand, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, how many people will try to book trains and so on. You will get, you know, annoying error messages like service and unavailable, or you could have ridiculous error messages like um, your session has expired. And this happened because you have double clicked on some option without mentioning, you know, what exactly uh, what the user did wrong or something like that. So if the modeling of the problem is wrong, um, the, then your program could be worse than having no solution at all. So uh, making the problem explicit is one of the important steps in programming. Right, uh, and once you get a problem kind of solved and uh, not uh, modeled uh, in real world, um, so you can now think of coming up with a logical step to solve this problem. So of course, in this course, modeling is not an important step, um, unlike in software engineering courses. Here, all problems will be precisely defined, the constraints will be given and so on. Uh, and also some examples will be provided, like, okay, here is how the input will look like, and here is how the output should look like. And we'll also give an explanation of why the output is expected to be so. Okay, and this often does not happen in real life and this is part of a programmer's job to make it so explicit that you can write code about it. And once you have come up with a logical attack on uh, solving your problem, then you can decide uh, that, okay, here is a finite and step-by-step -step procedure to solve my problem. The language itself is not important. Um, like I said, I mean, um, depending on the comfort level that the programmer have, has. Uh, they can decide, okay, I'm going to solve it in C, I can solve it in Python, I can solve it in Java, depending on whichever language that the programmer is comfortable with, or depending on which uh, language the team is using. Okay, But the finite step-by-step -step procedure is what is more important. And uh, this finite step-by-step -step procedure is called an algorithm. Um, and uh, you can usually visualize this using a flow chart. Tradi traditional computer science courses have always started from flow charts um, and you know, go through the step-by-step -step solution and so on. We'll be slightly more loose. Uh, we'll just assume that any finite length, well-defined procedure is an algorithm and we'll try to code that up, okay? so. Uh, but there should be some step-by-step -step procedure, whether it's a flowchart or not. Uh, there should be some finite step-by-step -step procedure that you have a rough idea of how to begin with. And then you can start the programming process. Okay, so in, uh, in our real life, uh, are, there such uh, are there such programmatic step-by-step -step procedures? And uh, the most um, famous such a procedure would be something like a cooking recipe. And uh, people often say that you should not push an analogy beyond a certain limit, but the analogy of a recipe uh, goes a, a long distance in understanding the concept of an algorithm. And we'll come back to this again and again, uh, because many aspects of recipes are similar to what algorithms are. So how does a recipe look like? Okay, and this is from a, web, uh, a website um, on cooking. And it says, uh, you know, how do you uh, make a chocolate cake in a microwave? And so you start with uh, a collection of ingredients, refined flour, uh, baking powder, and so on. And then, uh, you know, so once you list the ingredients in uh, appropriate amounts, then you say, okay, how, once I have the ingredients, how do I make the cake? How do I bake the cake? So you say, okay, there are four steps. In step one, uh, sieve the flour. So any person following the recipe will expect a few things to happen, right? Uh, nothing 
which is described in the method. So during the method, you should not suddenly have an ingredient which is not listed in the uh, uh, in the original list. Okay, you should not suddenly say that I need cheese, and cheese is not listed as an original ingredient. Uh, people will get annoyed. Also, the reverse is true. You should not have a long list of ingredients and then have a method in which half of those ingredients are never used. So people expect a recipe to be a fairly tight description. Give me the ingredients, give me in what amounts you need them. And then once I have the ingredients, how do I follow a particular method where in 20 minutes I can bake a cake or something like that. Okay, and uh, you will see that algorithms also follow a similar structure. Uh, you will list the variables. These are the variables after uh, which I'll use during the computation. And then I'll say, here are the steps to solve the problem based on those variables. Okay, so this recipe has been taken from the web. Um, another famous example of algorithms in real life would be to, uh, you know, assemble, um, uh, you know, some uh, make it yourself project or furniture or something that you bought. Uh, so you will, along with the uh, disassemble pieces, the, you will, it will come with an instruction sheet. And then following the instruction sheet, you can kind of assemble the uh, furniture. So this is also um, uh, an example of a real life um, algorithm. Okay, uh, now for the final step, uh, you have to convert this algorithm, which is basically a step-by-step -step procedure that you've written on paper or you have a rough idea of what to do. Now you have to convert it into a working code. For that, you should pick a programming language. And uh, for this, uh, you should understand which language you have to pick and whichever language you pick, you should have a fair idea of uh, what is called the syntax, which is the grammar of the language and what we call the semantics, which is what exactly happens when you code in a certain way. How does the program work? Okay. Um, and if you, if at any phase, like if in the phase of um, making the problem precise, or if in the phase of uh, creating the logical solution or in the, in the phase of translating the logical solution into code. If there is an error in any of these phases, the solution will be wrong. The program will be wrong. So this is often called garbage in, garbage out. Uh, if your model is wrong or if your logical algorithm is wrong and if you code, code it up precisely because your logical algorithm is wrong, the program will also be wrong. Okay, so this is roughly the idea of um, the process of programming. And uh, uh, we have picked Python partly because uh, by many measures, this is the most popular programming language of the modern era. Um, uh, there is a rich amount of libraries that you can use. So if you want to build a web server, if you want to build a data analytics engine framework, many libraries are already available. So it enables you to build on the work of others in a very uh, time-bound manner. So Python is a very uh, uh, rich language. The other thing why Python became so popular is that it's a very simple language. Uh, it doesn't have too many syntactic uh, uh, constructs. The code look, once written looks very simple and readable. And this is why one of the reasons why many libraries were written in Python and now it has become one of the most popular programming language. Okay, so now um, let's have maybe a quick round of introductions before we begin uh, discussion of Python proper. Okay, so um, how do we do this? Uh, I guess they can go uh, from all their names and they can unmute and just say a couple yeah. of words about themselves. So maybe, uh, okay. Manish, can you take a lead on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, Amy, uh, I'm unmuting you. Can you say a few words about yourself? Hello? Okay. 
hear from her. Uh, Danny. Hi, yeah, I'm Danny. Um, I'm uh, I go to the Ivy Business School and um, I'm in the Masters of Business Analytics program. Yeah. So um, this is one of our courses. We're taking this course online. Okay. And, yeah. Um, I think I have a passion for analytics and I'm hoping to learn Python. Right. Thank you. Bandis? Hi, my name is Bandish, and I'm also a student at IV studying MSc in Business Analytics. Okay. Maybe you can uh, mention if uh, you have a programming background uh, or you're starting from scratch. Yes, so I have learned C and Java in my high school. Thanks. Okay. Amy, can you try once again? Uh, she, is, she was having some problem with her uh, microphone. Okay. Let's see. Okay, probably sometime later. Yeah. Okay. Elisa? Eva? Oh. Evan? Are people online? Or? No, they are online. I think they are trying this uh, thing for the first time, I guess, on this class. Mm. Uh, uh, you should try it out because it's a live classroom. So the the idea of having classroom is live classroom is that you can ask questions. Otherwise, you can find many recording recorded courses. So you should be uh, more interactive in this class. Um, Harsh. Uh, hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Perfect. Hi. Um, my name is Harsh. Um, I'm also in the business analytics course at uh, Ivy Business School. Um, I don't really have much of a programming background. I uh, have done a little bit of uh, Python on the side, but I, I it didn't really uh, I didn't it didn't really stick with me, which is why I'm taking this course again to really familiarize myself with it. Um, and yeah, I'm just really interested to uh, learn more about uh, you know Python because it's a very very strong uh, programming language and I'm looking forward to learning about the tips and tricks to make myself uh, better with it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ishani? Hello? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ishani and I'm a petroleum engineer. I just started my career as a associate business analyst and uh, I don't have any programming background so I would be starting from scratch okay so yeah that's why I've been taking this course thank you thank you Jackie Jason? Hi, my name is Yasser Aldara. I go to Ivy School. Um, I'm part of the uh, business analytics program. Um, I have no programming background. Um, I only know SAS, but I know Python is much harder than TABS. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, 
Jonathan? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm Jonathan. I'm currently studying my MSc Business Analytics at IAB as well. Um, I have a background in programming, mostly MATLAB and like C++, but some like basic understanding of Python. So I'm just okay. excited to learn a little bit more. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Kyle? Hello. Uh, yes, we can hear you, Kai. Okay, Mike. Uh, hey. Hi. Um, I'm also a student from Ivy. Um, and yeah, so like the others, I don't really have a programming background, but I know Python's really useful, so I'm really excited to learn this. Okay. Thank you. Natalie? Hello? Yes. Um, so I am also one of the MSc students. I don't have much of a programming background, but I'm excited to learn Python. Okay. Bolivia? Hi, my name's Olivia. I'm also a student at Ivy in the MSc program. I don't have a background in programming, but I'm excited to learn Python because I feel like there's a lot of applications to it moving forward. Okay. Thanks. Peter? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. I'm Peter. I'm also from Ivy Business School doing a master's in business analytics. I don't have a really big programming background, but I'm excited to learn Python. Okay. Uh, Summit? Hi guys, this is Sumit. Uh, I am currently uh, 15 years of experience in IT industry and currently working with a um, leader in uh, phone industry. I did my MCA, so uh, it's a master in computer applications way back in 2004. So I have been working in Hadoop applications um, since past three years now. And I want to move into the machine learning uh, down the line. So that's why I'm just trying this course. So that's all about me. Java, right? Your, your experience. Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, your experience is in Java. No, I'm not experienced in Java. I'm experienced in um, Hadoop infrastructure services. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I do develop some scripts in Shell, but uh, as far as Python goes, this is my first breath with it. Okay, thank you. Shiv? I think I don't see microphone in front of Shiv, so I don't think he has access to microphone. Ooh. So again, um, yeah, the last, Shiv Khanna, I don't see uh, he has a microphone right now. So again, I would encourage you to take it as seriously as you would take a class for any course at IV. Um, the other thing, uh, this is the first class, but I would encourage you to keep your video on as well so that you are focused and engaged during the classroom. It's very easy on the online course if you are, people are not, you're not seeing the other students and other students not seeing you to get, um, get diverted and start doing some other things in between. Uh, and you think that this is trivial and you'll follow it later, but it's better to keep focused. And uh, every, um, few minutes we'll be asking questions and from the next uh, lecture onwards we'll be having online uh, we'll have quizzes as well uh, during our lecture so please ask questions if you at any point if you think that uh, you are not following the material either you can put it on the group chat or you can interrupt or we'll take pause uh, every few minutes and check with you if you are following the material okay all right uh, over to uh, Satya.
Hi. Uh, so uh, let's uh, continue. If you have any questions, so maybe uh, every three or four slides, I'll pause a minute. Uh, I, I mean, for a moment, and then if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt me at that point. Um, so yeah, this uh, class is meant to be interactive, and uh, please feel free to make comments or if you spot an error, please let me know. Okay, so we'll uh, start with a few basic things in Python programming. Um, so what's the cycle, how does Python programming look like as a pro procedure? procedure? Um, so you write or what is called edit code in a environment um, which is called a programming environment or an IDE, an integrated development environment. Then once you write the code, you just run the code, give it some input. And uh, if the code ran okay, and it gave the expected output, then you may decide that uh, you know, you're satisfied or something like that. If it didn't run, there definitely is an error in your code. Uh, or it, if it ran but gave an unexpected output, then there's some error in your code and you go back to editing the code. Okay. And if it ran okay, then you can decide that you're satisfied um, or you may decide that I may need to give more inputs to see whether it runs in all these cases, all the cases that I'm interested in. And then uh, once you're done and you have no more inputs to test on, you can say that, okay, I'm done with the code, right? So this loop, uh, which is write and then run and seeing whether it is okay, that is how a uh, programming cycle in Python is going to look like. Uh, and it's um, a lot of times, um, programming is more or less a trial and error procedure. It is often the case that things may not run in the first go. And this is no uh, reason to feel dejected and give up. Uh, you try to you know, focus uh, by looking at each line, what could be the possible errors and um, try to pinpoint what could be wrong with it un until everything runs to your um, specifications. So during the course, maybe um, a few examples, I'll walk you through. Um, so I'll, we'll, I'll pick a problem and then um, write some code and then we'll decide that, okay, this doesn't quite work. Now, how do you know uh, what is wrong with it? So let's pinpoint what's wrong with the program, go line by line, and then try to fix the work. And that pro procedure of finding out errors, fixing them so that the program runs more correctly, uh, this is what a programming cycle is going to look like. So trial and error is part of the coding process. Okay, so you write that program in, uh, or, uh, edit your program in an uh, editor, and then run your program on an output. Now, Python is an interpreted language, unlike, so a few of you have experience in C and C++ and Java. Uh, there's another step involved in those languages, which is called the compilation step. Python does not have a compilation step. If we go back just a minute, uh, as soon as you write the code, you can immediately run the code. There's no compilation step here. If the output is not correct, you try to correct the program until um, you know and run it again to see whether it is now correct and so on. Okay, so now uh, for the development environment for Python during this course. Okay, so uh, for this course, I'll follow um, an online uh, programming environment called Trinket, uh, which I'll share uh, on the website. Already some quiz, quiz questions for the course have a trinket embedded into it. So this uh, is a web-based uh, IDE, which means that you can run it on your browser. You don't need to install anything on your computer. Uh, and it consists of an editor and a console, uh, which is where you see the output and you want to interact with the program and so on. So you edit your code in, um, the editor and then you run the code and see the output in a console. 
so the ID looks like this, uh, where inside uh, on the left pane, you have the editor where you say that my code is print hello world. Um, okay, and we'll go through this process. Just uh, I'll show a few screenshots and then we'll go into a live uh, editing session. Okay, once you have edited the program on the top, you can see this button called run. And if you click it, then on the right side. Intra, uh, do you want to use your slides right now because it's not visible? Oh, I didn't share it? Yes. Sorry. Um, yeah, so you may want to go back to Trinket and show just quickly Trinket. Okay, I don't know. Okay, just a minute. There's something wrong with screen sharing. Um, let me just... Okay, is it visible now? Yes. Okay, so yeah, so as I was saying, uh, the ID that we'll use in the course is something called Trinket, which is, uh, uh, it's an ID uh, development environment that runs inside a browser. So you don't need to install anything on your computer. And it has an editor and a console. Uh, and uh, it looks like this. Uh, we'll, we'll go into a live session uh, soon, but just to uh, see a few uh, screenshots. So it says, you know, on the left pane is the editor and you type your code into the editor. It's currently says just hello world and uh, a print hello world. And then uh, on top of the window, you can see a run button. And once you click on the run button, it will uh, run your code and the result of uh, executing your program will be seen on the right pane. So it will just say, uh, you know, powered by Trinket. I mean, just below that it says hello world, which is what I wanted to say, uh, what I wanted the program to do. Okay, so that's the output. Now there's another component called console. So if you click on the run button and the small down arrow uh, on the button, you, you can see another option called a console. And uh, again, it opens in the right button. And uh, console is an interactive shell that you can type things in and you can see the output immediately. So this is in addition to editing on the left pane, you can also say that, okay, I'll try to make some small code run in the console. So this is an interactive shell and you can interact it by uh, typing small pieces of code, like for example, type one. So it shows some output corresponding to that and so on. So you can, um, in Python, you can either edit it on the left pane, or if you want to do some quick evaluation, you can do it by typing, opting for the console and then typing it in. Okay. Um, okay, so let's, uh, before we go further, uh, let's just um, try a live session. So I'll go to this window. Which window is showing now? Is uh, it the trinket? Yes. It's showing the trinket window. Okay, so yeah, uh, I hope this is visible to everybody. So I'll just, uh, so this is how the window looks like in, in inside your browser. Um, I'll add some um, instances of the trinket window uh, that you can run directly off the ACADS website. But um, uh, here is uh, a file called main.py. And then uh, I can type in um, some small code. So for example, hello. And uh, there's a run button on top. And if I click on it, 
uh, on the right pane it shows the output hello um or uh, so when you have a large amount of code to uh, enter you typically do it in python uh, in the editor pane but you may often need just a small um, you know script uh, just to try out something for the time being and for that you can opt for this thing called console and you see the console uh, has a prompt which is this uh, left arrow or right arrows and uh, there you can type some small expressions let's say 3 plus 4 and it shows the result uh, of an evaluation of course you can type uh, any python line here uh, in the shell in the console and it will show the output there then and there so uh, there are two ways to run uh, something in python one is to save it in a file edit it here so you can also say print uh, 3 plus 4 and then um, just say run so now there are two instructions in the file which is print hello so it, that's the first line of the output and the second is print 3 plus 4 so it printed 7 so you can either do this or pick the console and then uh, type whatever you want directly there so it can execute small lines of python code and this is very convenient because if you want to try out something before you incorporate it in your into your code you can quickly try it out in the console and then come back okay so both of them are quite useful so for the moment i'll go back to the slides okay so um a python program can communicate its result uh, to the output using print statements we we have seen some examples like print hello which we put within single quotes or print 3 plus 4 which we directly gave it as a number a numerical expression and um, on the other hand you may also need to take uh, information from users so for example maybe um, uh, you're building a reservation system and you want to take uh, the name and the age of the traveler or the customer um the function that python 3 uh, uses the latest version of python uses to read an input is uh, uh, the function called input and it takes the user's input and uh, reads it into a string we'll come to what string means in python and so on okay so uh the input function takes an argument uh which is the message to be printed on the uh, console and then when the user types an input it returns that as a string okay so details on how the string works will be later okay so let's just uh, take a live example go back to trinket okay so for example i can say uh, input and the message that is given to the user is please enter your name your first name okay and this will return a string so um, when the user enters something it will uh enter uh, so it will return a string and this can be used later in your program okay, so let's call it first name first name. let's see what happens when we run it okay so when you run it it says uh, please hello which was the first message to be printed and then please enter your first name i'll enter let's say satya okay so it uh, took the user's input and stored it in uh, this variable called first name and the last sentence said okay print the value of the variable first name so the value of the variable first name is whatever the user entered okay 
or I can make a slightly prettier print, uh, prettier message like uh, hello uh, together with first name. Okay. So I'll say, sorry. Right? So you have uh, a small interactive program which takes a user input, uh, stores it in a uh, variable called first name and then prints a message hello followed by first name so it has uh, it's a small interactive program so the lesson here is that print is something that is used to print some value in the program out to the console and input is used for the reverse purpose it is used to take an input from a user and store it in some variable and that variable you may use it for further needs in your program. So I'll stop at the moment. And uh, do you have any questions? You can unmute and ask a question, or you can also put it on the chat. Both ways are fine. OK, there's somebody uh, with a message. No questions so far. OK, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, OK, so we have seen uh, a small um, program or, which takes a user input and then prints out some message based on the input. Okay, so uh, if you say like, uh, how old are you um, as an input, it will print that message and you print 35, uh, you enter 35. 35 is not taken as a number, it is rather taken as a string. So it will print uh, you are 35 years old. So it gives a small interactive program. Uh, so it will print uh, you're 35 years old. Now, um, if you print, uh, uh, if you uh, give a uh, function called type, so age was the variable into which you stored the user input. The user input was 35 uh, and uh, you stored that. Okay, this. as well as currently. Okay, somebody has asked, do you want us following along and uh, writing code in Trinket as well currently, or just follow what you're doing on the screen? So right now, uh, for this lecture, just follow it because this is an introductory lecture. Um, and we'll give uh, assignments and small quizzes where you can try out things on Trinket. And uh, uh, later we'll, uh, in later lectures, we'll also have some programming assignments which you can code on Trinket and then submit. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so let's, uh, coming back to the, uh, what we were discussing. So we have um, the user entered 35 and we stored it into a variable age. And using the function type of age, you can see what type age is. And contrary to what we expect, we expect age to be something like an integer because 35 is after all a number. And it will say that uh, age is a string. This is because input takes whatever input that the user took, uh, user has entered and takes it into and stores it as a string. Okay. So for example, the, um, you can't say something like 35 plus two or something like that because 35 is a string. Okay, so what we have seen so far is that programming is modeling, coming up with a logical solution, and then coding in a programming language of your choice. Uh, we have introduced Trinket, which is a web-based IDE. Uh, we have seen how to interact with Trinket. Either you can edit your code in the left pane and click the run button, or you can take the console and directly type your code into the console. Either way, you can interact with Trinket. And we have also seen how to um, uh, 
um, print certain uh, messages onto the output as well as take some input from the user. So these are the basic things. Now let's look at a few elements of the Python language in more detail. So a Python program is a sequence of uh, definitions and commands. Okay, uh, we'll come to definitions in due course. Right now, everything that we have written, like print or input or type or anything of that sort, is a command. Okay, so commands manipulate objects, and objects are a precise concept. We'll see in the course, um, and each object has a type. Okay. So a type is a set of values and you can operate on these values. And so ex examples of types that we'll see in this course are integers, floating point numbers, which are certain kinds of real numbers. Uh, similarly, strings. Okay, so when you say string is a type and integer is a type, integers support, let's say, operations of addition, multiplication, division, and so on, whereas for the type called string, division is an operation that probably does not make any sense. So what kind of operations that a certain object supports will depend on its type, okay? So these are the concepts that we will use in due course and we'll define them properly in due course, okay? Right now we have seen only statements and variables. So using, um, um, variables and types and things like that, you can build what are called expressions. And uh, so we have been using a few types in the program so far, and you should be familiar with uh, the notion of a type from uh, school mathematics. So we, we normally see um, natural numbers, which take values one, two, three, and so on. And then they support operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and comparison like greater than, less than, and so on. So these are operations that you can do on the type of natural numbers. You may also have seen complex numbers, uh, which are written like five plus three i, where five is the real part and three is the imaginary part and so on. And complex numbers will support uh, operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, conjugation, which is not defined for natural numbers, but it's defined for complex numbers and so on. So depending on which type your object is, um, it may support different operations. Um, and you may remember from school mathematics that you cannot compare two complex numbers to see whether they are greater than or less than. You can compare two complex numbers to see whether they're equal to each other, but uh, certain operations which natural numbers support will not be supported by complex numbers. And conjugation is an example where complex numbers support the operation, but natural numbers do not. Okay, so now uh, let's look at how, uh, these are mathematical concepts that we've see, seen in school mathematics. How do they correspond to types in the Python programming language? There's uh, the int type. So these are um, integers which have an upper bound and a lower bound. So uh, small integers like 732 or you know, negative integers like minus five are okay. Uh, but there is a maximum possible representable integer and a minimum possible representable in integer. We'll see this, the exact bounds later. Similarly, uh, real numbers are represented by what are called float, okay? Uh, these will be numbers of the form, let's say 3.14, which is an approximation of pi that you may want to use in your program or 2.0 or something like that. So floating point numbers are um, the machine representation of real numbers. Now, in addition to integer, you, suppose uh, you may want to use um, uh, large, very large integers in your program, which int does not support. So you may uh, use this type called long, which support long integers with unlimited precision. In addition, one commonly used type is string. We have already used this when we said print hello world, or when we took the user as user input uh, into the variable first name, uh, the type of 
uh, the user input would be taken as string. So uh, one characteristic of strings in Python is that it will be included in single quotes. Okay. So uh, it's customary to divide the types in Python into two types. One is scalar, which is indivisible uh, kind of atomic types, which don't, which cannot be further decomposed. For example, integers, floating points, uh, Boolean. Boolean would be something like true or false. And uh, there's a type called none type, um, which has a single object, which is called none. Uh, we'll, we'll see its use uh, later. Okay. So these are the types that we'll commonly encounter in the course. And these are scalar types. You cannot decompose them uh, further. There are also non-scalar types, which uh, have further internal structure. For example, uh, strings. Uh, when you have a string, you can say, what is its first character? What is the first character in the string? What is the last character in the string? Similarly, what is the length of the string and so on? So uh, non-scalar data types have internal structure, which often you can use in uh, writing programs. Okay, so uh, you can try this out uh, in the trinket uh, on your own. So for example, if I have the number 500 and you say type of 500, it will say it's an int uh, and so on. So if you type a decimal, um, uh, a real number with a decimal point uh, and you say type of that number, it will say it's a float. Uh, now true with a capital T um, is of type bool, which stands for Boolean types. Boolean types have two values, but one, one is true and the other is false. And if you give it a string, like hello class within single quotes, uh, then it will say that uh, it's of type str, which is a string type in Python. Understanding types and how to uh, handle errors in types is very crucial to programming in any modern programming language. Okay, so you have to get used to this fact if you're new to programming that certain objects have certain types and only certain kinds of operations are allowed for those types. Okay, so here's a um, composite, uh, slightly complicated object, type of three not equal to two. Three is an integer, two is an integer and not equal to is a comparison. So if since three is not equal to two, uh, it will return uh, the value of this expression is true. And we have seen earlier that type of true is boot. Okay, so three not equal to two evaluates to true and type of true is boot. And that's why it returned uh, a boot. Okay, so now we'll come to uh, something called, often we have seen in this example that uh, the user input uh, something uh, and we may take it as a string or there may be occasions where we need to treat it as a different data type. Okay, so for this, what we need to do is you can, con you can take a value of a certain type and convert it into a different type. Before we go into the uh, slide, let's see a practical, uh, I mean, uh, live example. And then I'll take some questions. Okay, so I'll take the trinket window. I hope it is visible now. Okay. Uh, just a comment, uh, Satya. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For this, uh, from the next lectures, probably you can have a trinket window uh, from the ACAD sites open. And so right. you can, while uh, Satya is uh, explaining something, you can try it at the time of lecture itself. Right. right. So I guess it, it won't conflict, right? Each person has his own instance. Correct, yeah. Okay. So yeah, sorry. So this time uh, I didn't embed it in the ACADS website. There is a quiz question in which uh, there's a trinket embedded into it, but the live session, I didn't embed it. Okay. Uh, so I'll just clear out this code um, and look at the code uh, and type in the code that was used in the slides. So for example, uh, I can say, um, uh, 
okay so this uh, prompts the user to input uh, their age and uh, if i say so okay so i, I let's let's say that i enter my age it will say that the type is string okay so now uh, i may need to do something further down in the code so if say something like if age is uh, greater than 60 uh, so we'll come to these constructs later but let's say that i want to do a comparison um, you are eligible for some privileges okay right now let's say that that's so it it just takes a comparison uh, so the user enters an age and depending on the age you are eligible to have certain more privileges available to you if i try to run this code uh, you will get something called a type error okay so let's try to uh, do that okay so this was completely um, um, nonsense right i mean I, i entered a number like 35 and what i got was that um, something okay so you're eligible for senior citizen privileges so this is happening due to uh, type error where the age you are age which is supposed to be treated as an integer is being treated as a string and something strange is happening in your uh, output okay so you're not meant to see this message right so one thing i may need to do is uh, to change the type of age from a string to an integer so i'll say that let let me uh, make it less confusing so uh, i'll call this value okay okay so this code what it's supposed to uh, do is that uh, it takes a user input stores it in a variable called value and then whatever value is we have seen it earlier that uh, value will be a string convert it into an integer okay and then uh, i'll print the type of age and now hopefully it should say that it's an integer okay okay so that worked so um okay, just just for comparison if i type the val uh, if i print the uh, value type so this should be a string and the age should be a number yeah so you can examine in the output that the first line says that value is of type string and the third uh, line says that val uh, integer age is of type integer okay and maybe at this point the earlier thing should work if age greater than 60 let's say something it didn't print the senior uh, output which is expected and let's try to run it again and uh, if i say that my age is 78 and now the comparison worked right so earlier we you saw that it was behaving in an absurd manner uh, i entered a small number and it said that uh, i'm a senior citizen uh right now i entered uh, i converted the input value into an integer and once that was done now things started behaving in a more reasonable manner so often you may have to convert uh, an object of a given type values of type string and you have to convert it to an integer so this operation which is to say int of value this is what is called a type conversion operator you take an object of a certain type and convert it into a different type and this is often needed in uh, programming languages in all kinds of settings
Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Okay, um, at this point, are there any questions? This is uh, quite unnatural in uh, real world settings. Okay, just a minute, there's a message. What is the type of value string in the first? Uh, why is the uh, type of value string in the first place? Uh, because um, input function always returns a string. Okay, it would be nice to have an intelligent input function which depends, which depending on the value that the user input will decide uh, that, okay, this looks like a string or this looks like a number or this looks like a float. But the input function that Python gives is pretty uh, plain. So it takes whatever the user gives and just returns it as a string. Um, okay, so you will have to do the extra work. But it's possible that you know some more intelligent language might have this operation, but Python doesn't have it. Okay, uh, I hope that answers. Thanks. Um, so okay, let's go back to yeah. So we have seen uh, an example of the type conversion, uh, and now. Um, so this is used to convert a, some value of a particular type to another type. Um, and we are used to converting integers to floating points in uh, normal maths. So for example, we don't distinguish between the integer three and the floating value 3.0 when a real number is expected. Now, the reverse process is also very common. Uh, we may get a floating point number like 3.6, and it's often truncated to S3. Uh, in financial settings, for example, it's typical to work with two decimal places after um, uh, after the decimal, uh, two, two values after the decimal point. So that can be seen as some kind of a rounding. So when you round or truncate a floating point number to an integer, this is can be seen as a type conversion in, uh, that we do in normal settings in uh, mathematics. So how do you convert from one type to another? Suppose you have a string uh, and you want to convert it to, into, into an integer, you say int of that variable. Okay, so the type names themselves are used as type converter functions. We've seen this, so uh, int of 2.5. 2.5 is a floating point number. Uh, and when you say int of 2.5, it will return a two. Similarly, int of 2.3 will be a two, int of 3.9 will be a three. So please watch out that uh, this conversion from float to integer is not rounding, uh, it is truncation. If it, if it were rounding, you would expect that int of 3.9 would be four, but um, it, it returns a three. So it basically it truncates to the integer part. Now, if you, you can also do the reverse. So if you give an integer and say float of three, it converts the integer into a float. Similarly, uh, int of 73 within quotes. So 73 within quotes is a string. So it takes the string and returns the number that it represents. So this is 73. This is similar to the program that we just wrote, where we took an age as a string and then convert it into an integer. We saw that if we didn't do that, the, then the program would behave in very strange fashion. Okay, now you can try out uh, certain uh, error, uh, erroneous conversions. So if you have a string like a cats, okay, and try to convert it into an integer, uh, it really can't do it any, in any meaningful way. Uh, you can try this out in the trinket uh, session and you, you will see an error message. Okay. So it says invalid literal for int with base 10. So it says that the ACAD string cannot reasonably be interpreted as a base 10 integer. Okay. Uh, 
which is which is reasonable 73 could be done because it it looks like a number whereas a cats is not a number and therefore cannot be reasonably converted into a string into an integer so you will get some error message if the type conversion cannot be done okay so try out a few of these so we have seen uh, uh, this okay input always returns a string and then in in order to convert it uh, into an integer so if you directly do age plus 5 it will give an error message but uh, if you say in 5 years your age will be int of age plus 5 what it does is it converts age which was a string into an integer which is now the number 35 and adds 45 here okay, in 5 years your age will be 40 So, so Satya, I have one poll for the students. Just one second, related okay. to what you cover. Can you see this poll? It's based on type. Yeah. Okay. So, is it live? So there. Yeah, yeah. They, we see six students have answered. Seven now. Okay. So this is something which Satya specifically covered in the last slide. So pay attention to what you're at. Okay, it seems a lot of students have answered. So I am ending it. Five more seconds. If anyone else um, want to answer. Okay, so okay. Can you see the results? Right. Um. Okay. Yeah. So I guess most people have got it. So most. Uh, yeah. So one thing was that the type of here is was uh, it was a bit tricky because here, remember note that three point zero is it's not three point zero. It Actually, was it's within quotes. It's within quotes. So so a, hmm. so it was a string. So it was a trick question. So yeah. So this is. Um, please pay attention to the single quotes. Um, yeah. So you so can go back to the previous one. Yeah. If you just go back to the. This int seventy three. It was similar to that. Yeah. So the int of seventy three, right? I mean, uh, so the string seventy three is within quotes, so it's a string. Okay, so we want to relaunch. No. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead with uh, some operators. We have already seen. Uh, it in the previous slide, uh, you said int of age plus five. So the common arithmetic operators um, that are supported by the integer type are uh, plus minus star, which stands for multiplication. Um, this division has two um, uh, modes. One is this double slash, and the other is the single slash. Um, and I'll mention that in a minute. And then percentage stands for the modulo operator, which is the remainder after division. Double star uh, is the exponentiation. Just a minute. Okay, there's a question. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the double slash and the, so uh, I think the most common thing um, is to have uh, um, you know if you if you have an integer three and another integer four, what is the uh, result of division of three by four? Okay. So you will expect something like point seven five, uh, but in other cases 
you may want the result of the integer division. So you want only the quotient. So uh, the quotient is going to be zero in this case. So you want to distinguish between uh, cases where something like three by four is supposed to return me the floating result, which is 0.75 or results where I just need the quotient, which is always an integer. So if I, if I want the quotient operation, then I'll use a double slash. If I want the proper division, which gives me a floating point result, then I'll use the single slash. Okay, so please note this. And uh, there is a quiz question in which uh, I've used the double slash operator. Try the same, uh, so try the code with the single slash operator as well. Uh, it is both of them are meaningful in that particular question. Uh, the comparison operators can be like uh, equal to, not equal to, and so on. Uh, greater than, less than, so. greater than or not, uh, greater than or equal to is written in the following way: you have a greater than symbol and then an equal to. Less than or equal to, you have the less than or e less than symbol first and then the equal to. Okay, the uh, if you're completely new to programming. The double equals is a huge mistake that all programmers make. Uh, the, in the next line, you can see something called the assignment operator. Uh, that is the single equal to sign. And it's, it's, a, it's a big mistake. And uh, it's a, based on the behavior of your program, it's very hard to detect this. That uh, uh, often people use a single equal to when they mean a double equal to. So we'll have uh, a few practice questions so that you get used to these differences. Okay. The other operators are slightly more tricky. Uh, there are operators available in Python, but I'll try to avoid using them because their semantics, the, what they mean is slightly tricky to understand. Uh, okay, but for the sake of listing, they're, they're present there. Uh, you also have logical operators like uh, and, or, and not. So true and false will evaluate to false. True or false will evaluate to true. Not of true will evaluate to false and so on. So these are logical operators. And then there are bitwise operators where you can uh, operate on uh, two bit sequences. And uh, so these are advanced topics that we'll probably not use in the course because the integer types will uh, use integer types, integer operations and comparison operations on the integers. But for the sake of listing, these will be given and you can use it in your code. Okay. In addition, you have membership operators like in and not in, and we will use them extensively as the course. So identity and so on. So these are membership and identity will be used when we cover more sophisticated data structures. And in the, in the final lectures, these functions, these operators will be used quite extensively. Okay. We not cover uh, uh, bitwise operators because that's slightly uh, beyond the scope of this course. Now, to end this session, uh, I'll briefly mention uh, the notion of variables. We have already used variables in the live code that we saw on Trinket. We have used first name, we have used age and so on. These are variables. Variable, uh, a variable is just a name associated with an object. And uh, we have used that uh, first name equal to input some method. So that equal to was the assignment operator. And assignment operator is used to say that this variable is associated with this value. Okay, so when you have an uh, expression like m equal to 64, okay, that semicolon is probably not there. But okay, if you just look at m equal to 64, 64 is the number, it's an int that you associate with the variable m. Okay, so you can imagine that your computer has a memory and somewhere in your memory, you store the number 64 and that value 64 will be associated with the name M inside your program. Okay, similarly, you can say C equal to the string ACADS, F equal to a floating point number 3.1416 and so on. Uh, a variable can change to a different value later in your code. So, Suppose your code equal 
is of the following nature m equal to 64 c equal to uh, within quotes a cats f equal to 3.1416 later in your quote you may say f equal to 2.7183 okay some approximation of e uh, so at some point in your code f may point to the value 3.1416 later at some other point in your code it may uh, refer to a different value so uh, variables can change uh, their association to values later in the code okay now what kind of names are valid so these uh, names are called identifiers and uh, the names are given to various concepts in the python language variables functions classes and so on names consists of letters digits and one particular special symbol which is the underscore symbol this is not the hyphen this is the underscore symbol um, as we saw in the code we have used two variables so far in our code that we have seen in the lecture one was age it was just a the small letter a g e uh at earlier we had seen another variable which was first name where it was first underscore name so both these are valid names so here are some examples of valid variable names uh count lab 5 and so on uh you cannot one one thing that's ruled out is you, your variable cannot start with a number so it always must start with either a letter or the underscore so phi lab is not a valid variable and you can mix capital letters and small letters so so here are some invalid variable names phi j because it starts with a letter min profit is a invalid name because there's a space in between lab dot 7 is invalid because dot is not a valid character uh the most important thing to note is that python is case sensitive so capital a a cats is different from small a a cats is different from all caps a cats these are different names um uh, and so the, the variable names are case sensitive and this is something to watch out for certain names are not allowed to be used because they are already used by the standard python libraries and the language they have special meaning these are called reserve so we have seen true with capital t false with capital fall uh, capital f class in is so these are all operators we have already seen them so these words are already used by the python language in some form or the other and therefore they are not available to us as uh, name so these are uh, things to watch out for you, know, you should not a uh, name a variable false and say false equal to something you may get an error so there is a cheat sheet that we have provided along with the course and in that cheat sheet you can look at the reserved keywords what are the operators available and so on okay so uh, you should always choose meaningful names in your code um so if you just use a variable like c uh, it's not easy to understand what c stands for whereas if you give a more uh, descriptive name like count okay you know that it's meant to store the count of something um, and it should be read it, uh, uh, easily readable and understandable so count is preferable to c underscore o underscore and so on um we would recommend that you have full words complete words and abbreviate only when it's clear what it means so max is all right because um, but in certain cases abbreviation actually confuses things so we recommend that you give full words okay and avoid unnecessarily long names so as in everything there is a balance okay so counter is preferable to a loop counter so these are things there but you know follow your own judgment okay so i'll uh, stop this session with uh, just a discussion of the assignment statement so if you say a variable equal to expression this is an assignment statement in python we have seen examples where we said first name equal to something age equal to something and so on okay. so computes the expression value on the right hand side and then stores it on the left hand side so this is what the variables 
variable equal to expression is supposed to do. Okay, so here are some examples: x equal to ten, uh, disk two equal to uh, b b times b minus four times a times c. So all these are expressions, and so you have expressions on the right hand side and variables on the left hand side. You cannot have it the other way around. You cannot have expressions on the left side and variables on the right side. That doesn't work. Okay, so the expression is first evaluated, and then it is stored in the right side. Okay, so I think we are uh, nearly out of time and out of the slides. So there are some quizzes that uh, we have posted on the website. Uh, please uh, try them out. They are not extremely uh, involved because this is just the first session. In case you have any difficulties, uh, please let us know by emailing. The, my uh, email has been given satyatakads.org. Uh, and if you have any difficulty or you can't uh, figure out something, please uh, let us know. Um, one thing we have to decide is the tutorial time, right? The office hours. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to launch something on poll and okay. we'll get this information. So I'll, 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 I'll stop sharing. Uh, that's fine. You can keep this slide. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I was going to mention that since this is an introductory course, uh, the grading will be based on quizzes. So the yeah. quizzes are graded. So make sure that you submit your quizzes before the next class. Quizzes are due before the next class and that's how we'll follow. Uh, they will be uh, programming assignments that's for your practice. Uh, Satya will be giving all along. Uh, also, I think uh, we'll just launch a couple of polls to get some feedback. And then we'll tailor this course based on your feedback and to see that it's most uh, useful to you. And give, uh, give your honest feedback. If you didn't like something, that's fine. We can uh, learn, we all can learn and we can make changes here. Yeah, please be frank because this is the right point to correct uh, if you feel that the pace is too slow, the pace is too fast, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and for the students who have some prior knowledge of um, other programming languages like Java and C++, we will be posting some uh, challenging problems as well uh, on our site, which will be in Python. So you can learn the Python syntax and try out those problems. Uh, that will cover different aspects like writing, uh, coming up with an algorithm, modeling, and then writing the code and testing your code as uh, Satya was mentioning, and then you can we can discuss those problems during office hours. But since majority of the the class is uh, they don't have uh, programming experience, and since this is a introductory course, so we will stick with a slow pace and cover all the basic materials, assuming that you have no prior experience. So just I want to set the uh, expectation right here. So you may find you may find few things which are very basic, but we have to cover in this course. Okay. This was one. Uh, okay. So I guess uh, nobody said that it was difficult to follow. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, like I said, uh, some of you may uh, find this uh, very elementary because this is meant to be elementary. Um, it's supposed to take you from uh, zero programming experience to a level where you can confidently write at least small programs. And uh, so, um, and for people who are familiar with programming in other languages, hopefully you can compare and contrast with the languages that you already know. So one difference we have seen, we've seen already is that Python has no compiler. You directly write code and run it. So that, uh, so uh, if you already know some languages, 